In 2008, the writer Kevin Kelly published this essay about a big, exciting, ultimately kind of simple idea. If you want to make a living doing something creative, you don't need millions of fans or even hundreds of thousands of fans. You just need a thousand true fans. The math works, Kelly argued, because of the internet. The internet gives everybody everywhere the ability to connect with everybody else. And it means that people like writers and musicians no longer have to go through intermediaries like publishers and music labels and retail stores that traditionally wound up capturing most of the revenue from the sales of creative work. If you can find your thousand true fans, Kelly argued, and if you can figure out a way to sell your work directly to those fans, you can make a living doing the creative thing you love to do. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and this is What's Your Problem, the show where entrepreneurs and engineers talk about how they're going to change the world once they solve a few problems. My guest today is Chris Best. Chris is the co-founder and CEO of Substack. Substack is a company that helps writers send subscription-based email newsletters, which, as Chris says, is a very simple idea built on top of some very grandiose beliefs, beliefs about culture and ideas and commerce. More to the point, Substack is one of the best tests I've seen of the theory of a thousand true fans. The idea for Substack came to Chris and his co-founder Hamish back in 2017. At the time, Chris had just left Kick, a messaging platform that he'd co-founded, and there were lots of things he thought had gone wrong with media and the internet. He'd always been an avid reader and a believer in the power of writing, and he wanted to share his ideas with the world. And so naturally, I was like, well, I should write. How hard could that be? Um, it's just typing. I already know how to type. And I started writing what I thought was going to be an essay or a blog post that was kind of just detailing my frustrations with the state of media and the internet. <laughs> um, it was sort of this, uh, like a complaint or a screed of some sort that was just like, um, the internet came along, made it global and instant and free to distribute writing, which is great. But at the same time, these platforms killed a lot of the business models that used to support great writing. Craigslist killed the classifieds, Facebook and Google took over the advertising industry. And now we're all sort of stuck clawing for attention on these various feeds. Wah, 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 complain, complain. And I sent this piece of writing to my friend Hamish, who's actually a writer. And he very gently told me, you're not uh, the original snowflake you think you are in 2017, <laughs> writing a thing that says, wah, wah, maybe Facebook is bad for us. Like, you know, this this is uh, not exactly fertile ground. <laughs> you didn't get the scoop on that one. Yeah, I didn't get the scoop on that one. He's like, I'll tell you that all of my friends who are writers are not going to be shocked to hear that there's been some disruption to the business model that supports their work. Um, and basically, like, look, you may be right about all of this, but so what? Uh, and he sort of asked the question. He said, the more interesting thing would be like, what do you do about it? It's easy to complain. It's easy to poke holes. But let's assume that all of this is true. How could you even, how could things be different? How could things be better? Um, and we started sort of arguing about that and batting around a bunch of things. And we were both subscribers to Ben Thompson's Stratechery uh, at the time. And we were like, you know, that dude's making... Right. Which is, just to be clear, that's a, a paid newsletter that lots of people in the in the tech industry subscribe to. It's an email yeah, newsletter it's a, that he charges exactly. for. It's a, paid, yeah. it's a paid email newsletter. We were seeing other people doing these things where they're like, you know, you can write something, you can charge for it. We were just fascinated by this thing. And we ended up sort of hitting on the idea of Substack as this very simple thing that does kind of two things. Um, on the one hand, it's this very grandiose idea that's aimed at this broad societal problem of like, hey, this the, the total domination of all of our attention by this business model of these engagement maximizing platforms is bad. And we need to like create a real alternative for that with a different business model. And, you know, it's like an alternate universe with different laws of physics for how you spend your time and attention. Very highfalutin. But on the other hand, it's like, what if you could send people email and charge them money for it? <laughs> Right, right. Which and it's is, pretty low polluting. It's like, yeah, you yeah. know, it's a and very like, specific thing that some people would want. It's a newsletter. Want. It's an email newsletter. Uh, yeah, people so, know what a newsletter, it's like actively unsexy technology. <laughs> yes, right, right. Um, so, I mean, I'm curious. So, you know, obviously Substack is a thing now. I have to say, like, I, 
I don't think of it as a substitute for, you know, Twitter. Twitter is my social media of choice, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I think of it as more of a close substitute to something like The Atlantic or The New York Times, who in fact are now clearly building their own email newsletter businesses, partly, I presume, in response to your uh, success at Substack, right? Have you found in whatever data you have that Substack is a, a substitute for social media? I think it's at least a sub. I mean, it's at least a substitute in that as readers, as consumers, we end up having kind of like a finite amount of time. Yeah. So every right. minute somebody is reading Substack is a minute they're not looking at social media, but could be. And that sounds kind of ridiculous when you sort of reduce it. It's like everything is in competition with everything else. Yeah. But I actually think that's sort of like the fundamental shift that we've undergone. Like the whole dawn of social media was because we used to live in an age where it was possible to get bored. Yeah. And you would have time in your life where you're like, gee, I'm I'm bored. I wish I had something to spend my attention on. And if somebody could come along and give me something for free to do, that would be a great deal. And we've just come to the end of that age. There just there just isn't. You, every chunk of your attention that you ever want to spend on anything has been taken up. And in fact, there's increasingly loud clamoring. And yes, this, your you know, phone the, will every gladly is, absorb every second of your brain life. Right. Still, though, I mean... It's possible that Substack, the, the attention Substack has taken, and I'm happy for it. I think it's great that writers can make money, and I'm excited to talk about that. But it's possible that that has come mostly from, not from social media, but rather from unsocial media. I mean, you literally have people leaving traditional media places where they are writing columns and starting to write Substacks, right? Like that's the, it's a very natural kind of adjacency. No, yeah. you know, to be honest, it's almost certainly both. You know, people that had people that were working as professional writers, yeah. right? A lot of them can go to Substack and get a great deal. That's awesome. We love it. But there's an even bigger cohort of people who were not professional writers before and who, but for Substack, might not have been writing. Um, either uh -huh. young people who didn't see a path and sort of, you know, might have gone to, you know, had something to give the world as a writer, and without this model, might have had to go to law school like their parents wanted them to, or people that work in industry or people that, that have some adjacent thing that, you know, making, building an audience on sometimes on Substack and sometimes building a fortune and who, but for Substack would otherwise not be writing. It's not like they would, you know, have right. a job at the Atlantic or something. And, and who, who I have never heard of, who most people have never heard of, right? Uh, right. Which is cool and interesting. I mean, it's kind of like a smaller YouTube in that way, right? Where there's just this vast array of niches that people can fill. Uh, and so, I mean, I am curious to that point to get a sense of basically the, the distribution of, uh, I don't mean the literal email distribution, but the sort of distribution curve of Substacks, of the newsletters people write. Like, how big is Substack? How big is Substack? What have we shared? I think we've shared that we're over a million paying subscribers Okay. Hundreds of thousands of people have started a Substack. I forget what our latest so thing is. Sorry. A million paying subscribers. And is the what is the, well, I guess for that one, the average subscription is like 60 bucks a year-ish? Yeah, 80, somewhere in there. Okay. So is that something like uh, $80 million a year that people are paying, not, not to you, obviously, but to the writers of which you get 10%? Is that the ballpark way to think about it? Yeah, I mean it's it's more than that, but it's that's you know that's the so the right the, the ballpark. If I if I ballparked it at a hundred million for the writers, ten of which goes to you, would I be not wildly wrong? You're in the right order, magnitude. Okay, um, and then so within that, like to, to, again to your point of like, well, there's a few famous people, and you know, I'm curious to know how how the how the distribution works there. You know, how much are the top people making, and then like, what's the median? Yeah. So the the distribution is super sort of power law, as you might expect. Yeah, yeah. So I think the the top 10 people make something like 20 or 25 million bucks a year between them. Wow. Good for them. They should only live no. and be well. Yeah. People yeah, who are I mean, making millions of dollars a year, individuals are making millions of dollars a year. Individuals are making millions of dollars a year. But a very small number. It's like the, the Taylor Swift of Substack. And there's, you know, there's, there are actually quite a healthy number of people who are making, you know, real money 
if you think of real money as like multiple times what you'd make as a writer at a publication. I definitely uh, think of that as real money. <laughs> I, um, but, but okay, so your your question is like, yeah. what's the distribution? And the yeah, thing and, here and like, what, tell me about the median person. Like, yes, there are some superstars, and I am happy for those superstars. But what's like a normal? Like, how many people are making fifty thousand dollars a year? Like fifty thousand dollars a year is like a perfectly you know, that's a, that's a living. And if you can write your own email newsletter and make $50,000 a year, that's cool. But how many of those people are there? I mean, it's like hundreds, I think. Okay. Okay. I mean, if you're charging five bucks a month and you can get a thousand, a couple thousand people to pay you five bucks a month, like that's a living. And like a couple thousand people isn't that many, right? So like, how does that work? Are there examples of that? Are there sort of things you've found that people have made that work? Are there particularly interesting niches people have filled? That math is very important to why Substack works. The fact that a relatively small number of people can chip in five bucks a month and start to be meaningful. And it's interesting because if you can get to a thousand, there's usually not a reason you couldn't get to 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 over time. Uh, and then that's why you get this sort of power law thing where you have this, this upside. But there's lots of things about what it takes to get there. The thing that I think is most interesting about it, though, is how different the kinds of things you want to do to get there are from the things that would that you would do if you wanted to kind of like maximize your audience to get ad impressions. Uh -huh. Right. All of a sudden, uh -huh. your incentives. If you want to, if you're trying to get your thousand true fans, your incentive is to create something that a thousand people deeply value and fall in love uh -huh. with and want to pay you for and want to keep paying you for, right? You want to earn and keep the trust of a thousand people making something they deeply value. And what that means is that there's if there's something out there that's like that, that a thousand people would deeply value, but you couldn't necessarily get a million people to click on, it's very, very valuable on Substack. And so there's a whole class of very valuable stuff that otherwise might not get created that can now get created. And so, I mean, the obvious ones that come to mind are sort of business related. And there have been, you know, industry newsletters have existed for a long time for this reason, right? There are lots of industry newsletters that are $1,000 per subscription because, you know, your work is paying for it. I mean, that's one. Are there kind of less obvious ones, you know, ones that are more, oh, less, less work related, say? And that was one of our earliest questions. And we sort of, we wondered this. We're like, well, okay, people will, if they can, if they can, say that it's for their job or they can put it on the corporate credit card, they'll pay for it. But will they really pay for something else? Um, but pretty quickly, we had people doing kind of like literary comedy and culture writing and politics and the breadth of topics that it turns out that you can make on Substack is kind of ridiculous. Um, there's somebody writing reviews of canned fish. I don't know if he's making a ton of money, but it's like, that's the sort of level of, of niche well, you can get into. I was going to say, I mean, sure, it's the internet, right? So every niche you can imagine, and then a ton more that you can't imagine are going to exist. The interesting question to me is, what can you get a thousand people to pay five bucks a month for? And and maybe more to the point, like, what have you learned about how to do that? Because I feel like yeah. that trick is actually generalizable beyond Substack, right? That's the basic- totally you know, minimum viable product, find your core customers, make them love you, iterate. Like, I want to figure out how to do that better on the podcast that I make, right? It's clearly a more mass model. But still, the idea of like making a thing a few people really love, I think is is really compelling. And so what have you learned about how to do that specifically? Yeah. So topic can be almost anything. The things that really matter are you want to have a distinct perspective. Exactly what that means depends on what it is, but you want it to be either a distinct voice or a distinct worldview or some distinct expertise or a distinct sensibility, something where the thing that the people are paying for is not the content. Nobody has a problem. That, nobody comes to Substack and says, I wish I could get more email. I wish I had more things to read. Yeah, nobody right, has that right. problem, yeah. right? The thing that you pay for is I need this person's take or this person's thought or this person's recommendation. And I want them to curate a slice of my intellectual life or my attention for me. I want to delegate some of my worldview building to this person who I've built up this trust with over time. 
And in order to get that to be worth paying money for, you want that to be distinct enough that you're not, you know, that you're not giving them something that they could get in a hundred different places. And you do have to kind of think about that integrity, right? Being if they're if you're curating a slice of their attention, being judicious about what you're asking them to send, spend that attention for. If somebody gives you permission to send them emails or gives you adds you to their podcast player, it's not only should you send them good stuff, but you kind of want to not send them things that are not worth their time or are not interesting. You mentioned you called it integrity, but the idea of respecting people's time, their inbox, and it reminded me of the fact that not only is Substack subscription based people pay you know to get a lot of substacks it's pretty anti ad right like if you have a substack are you even allowed to put ads in your newsletter we definitely frown on it and this is an interesting point where we are very anti ad but we're also very pro freedom basically like we it's your editorial content you're allowed to put what you want so uh-huh. we've fallen short of saying we're going to police what you put in your newsletter, provided you're not literally spamming people, which we take a very dim view of. Um, but we don't build any ad technology. We don't, we're not sort of encouraging people to sort of have a hybrid model in general, even though that seems like it ought to be appealing. We think that focusing on the other thing actually maximizes the benefits of that thousand true fans logic. Tell me more. Tell me more about that. Is that you don't sound on the fence about it? Has the company been on the fence about it? Could you imagine becoming more pro ad? It's something we used to get a lot from writers and the the kind of the logic is like, hey, subscriptions are money, advertising is money, one money plus two money is better than just one money. Um, like it's like, wouldn't I make more money? Um, I think for in the writing world, people have seen enough success on Substack um, that it's st- people are starting to get that the this model is working. And I there's there's people who are in that category of people who are making millions of dollars a year on Substack, who I personally at the start had to convince to turn on payments. And they're like, uh-huh. no, I'm not going to, I'm going to go do some sponsorship thing, or I'm just going to grow it and I'm going to blah, blah. I don't think I, I mean, can really make any money. And to, then I'm like, no, clear, just, though, just try it. You know, you have whatever, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, very, very excellent publications that I pay for with my own money and I don't resent them running ads as well. Yeah, I can I can see the argument for that, and I, I think people can make the argument for podcasts. You know, I personally, every time I listen to a podcast and there's a break, that's like, now let me tell you about something else. I'm like, okay, Fair. like you're coming right uh, at me right now. You're coming not, right at I'm me. I'm not right gonna, now. and listen, yeah. I don't begrudge it, but I'm not gonna say that I love it. Now let me tell you about something else. We'll be back in a minute to talk about bundling, unbundling, and a problem Substack has not yet solved. Now, back to the show. So the first part of my conversation with Chris was largely about that thousand true fans idea. The next part of the conversation is about another famous tech saying. This one is like kind of half joke, half idea. And it comes from Jim Barksdale, who was a big tech guy back in the 90s. The key line is this. There are only two ways to make money in business. One is to bundle. The other is to unbundle. Like, what do you make of that quote? What do I make of that quote? I buy it. I think, and I'm. I agree with you that so far Substack has been this big unbundling energy, right? The fact that as an individual writer, you can go and start your own thing and make it on your own and get the upside of what you're doing, and sometimes make you know ten times as much money as you've ever made before, and have a business and all this stuff. Um, that's wonderful. It's a good thing. I actually think that there's a lot more energy left in that thing. Um, I think people people sometimes are like, well, what's going to happen when people are getting their eighth Substack subscription and they're really annoyed that they have to have so many different Substack subscriptions? And I'm like, you know what? I like bring on that problem. I would love to live in the world where that's sure. the biggest problem we have. I mean, obviously, there's you, some people that have you that problem in particular today. would love to live in a world where that's <laughs> the problem, of course. Um, and there's you know there are some people who who have that today. There's some people that are you know subscribed to a whole bunch of things, um, but but far and away, I think there's a ton of energy left in this sort of unbundling phase of like, I'm a writer, I have something to say, and I like I want it to be my thing. I do think there's an interesting effect where bundle economics are real. And if we are successful at the grand unbundling that we are in the middle of doing, at some point, there's this economic potential energy that for unlocking the the 
surplus of bundle economics for writers and readers. Um, and there's a bunch of ways you could imagine that happening. Like one thing that's happening already is that Substacks are turning into companies and institutions, right? People are starting as one thing and then building a newsroom or building a company. And the other thing that would be like the obvious thing would be like, well, what if you just had like a, a Netflix style thing or like this is what Medium did. It's like, why don't you just have one, a Substack subscription and then everything like, you know, there's some magic algorithm that doles out like who gets the money based on what. And the, the problem with that is that it, although it unlocks the bundle economics, it kills the fundamental magic of what's good about Substack, which is the direct intentional relationship yeah. between the reader and the writer, right? Like the whole deal is I choose what to spend. I don't know exactly what the right solution to this is yet, but my strong intuition is that the right answer is that you do in fact want a, a bundle or bundles, but that it needs to happen bottom up rather than top down. I think that, you know, the, as with anything, the hard part is making it simple. This is one of the fun yeah. things about building products, building good products is you like sweat and curse and wring your hands and pull your hair out for a long time trying to wrangle a thing. And if you actually do a good job, at the end of it all, you show somebody and they say, yeah, obviously. Yeah, right. You idiot. Like you spent how long? coming up with like an email newsletter with a website that takes money, you idiot. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's actually good, right? And, and you're not there yet for the bundle. Is that is that the upshot? Yeah, and, and for the bundle, you're, not you're still there in the hard the bundle. part. Yeah. And we're still in the hard part. And, and honestly, there's so much value right now. Like there's there's so much value uh, in these in in the subscriptions as they exist and we're already doing a bunch of things around cross promotion we let writers recommend each other rather than having some algorithm that recommends yeah, it yeah so that's another um, choice right in the same way that you're pretty clearly anti ad you seem pretty clearly anti recommendation algorithm and that one is maybe more surprising to me because you know discovery is hard and i feel like you must know a lot about what people read. And if they read one thing, they like another thing. Like, why not make that kind of, you know, collaborative filtering recommendation? Yeah. And I would add some nuance there. Like, I don't think I'm against recommendation algorithms per se, but I think that the specific thing that I'm suspicious of is the thing where you make a, an algorithmic surface that you as the reader delegate as the control of how you spend your attention that has some objective that may not be your objective. Well, now you just turn Substack into Twitter, right? That's the, that's the straw right. man version though. Or YouTube, right? Like you go to YouTube and it's like, yeah, yeah, you're subscribed to that, but like, don't worry, here's what you really but want to click. You don't have to do that. There's a way cooler version of it. That's just, hey, lots of people who read Iglesias also read Josh Barrow. You might want to check it out. Like that doesn't seem like you're trying to steal my mind like a social media platform. Yeah. And I think I, I would argue that we are doing the cool version of this, okay. right? Like the, okay. And the two things that are important to me in this are, number one, we're not just optimizing for engagement. We're not saying like, here's what you're going to click on. We're saying, here's yeah. what you might like enough yeah. that one day you would pay for it. And the other thing is where possible, we love to have it be human powered, right? When you go to read a book, the 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 fact that an algorithm said to you that it was the best possible book to you, even if you could know that was the truth, might be less compelling than somebody who you trust and have gotten to know says, hey, I think you should check this out for these reasons. And yeah. so when you can have things that are, that are you know, incentivized the right way and when you can have human beings in the loop, we just think that that's like a makes for a better experience. And we've shown that you can make recommendations that people deeply value that way. What's something you haven't figured out yet? Like what's something you're working on now? Something maybe you've tried and it didn't work? Like what's a what's a what's a problem you're trying to solve now? Okay, I'll tell you one thing that I'm really fascinated with is when you get a bunch of people who deeply value this one writer or this one crazy niche, and you find all the people who are willing to pay five or ten bucks a month for that thing. Not only have you given them a piece of media and a connection with the author they deeply value, you've created, you've sort of crystallized this potential community. The writing and the writer and the thing you subscribe for is kind of like the bat signal that draws in the people. But over time, the, the community ends up being a major piece of why of the value for people, right? Being among all the other people who value this enough to pay for it, not having a bunch of trolls because you can <laughs> moderate profitably. Um, 
And so I think there's a tremendous amount of potential energy there. It's something that writers uh, and podcasters really want from us. And I don't think that we've totally cracked the answer to it yet, but we've been trying a bunch of things. Some new stuff is coming up pretty soon that's pretty exciting. And I think if we can make the community aspect of it right, that will end up being tremendously powerful. Well, it's interesting because it's like creeping back toward social media, right? I mean, maybe a better version of it, but fundamentally, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, it's it's people talking to each other, people yeah. engaging with ideas, people building relationships. Um, and it's, again, it's sort of in this, I think of it as an alternate universe with different laws of physics from the universe where all of these giant platforms have grown up of the kind of like massive engagement-based ad-supported thing. That's uh -huh. one way to build it. And we're building in kind of this alternate rails. Um, so what's the thing you're about to roll out? Am I allowed to talk about this one? Yes. <laughs> so we've been working on we've been working on chat um, as something that you can do on Substack. Chat like real time, like like Slack style or GChat. Yeah, you could look at you could think of Slack. You could think of IRC back in the day. You could think of Discord as like an amazing thing. Discord seems like the closest model there. Is that right? I don't know Discord that well, but that's a very it's like a, it's a community oriented chat, right? I mean, is that what totally. I should think of for what you're working on? Yeah, I think closely related. Is it hard? Have you been trying it and like not quite figuring it out? It's been working fairly well. I would say we're being we're trying to be thoughtful about it, right? We, the thing we never want to do again is kind of break the magic of Substack. And in this yeah. case, one of the things that really matters is you want the writer to be in charge, right? This uh -huh. is something where if I'm if I have my community, like, and this is my little island, my own private social network, um, I want to be in charge of that. It's not. I don't want it to be something that ends up being like. And people, you know, there are Substack writers who have tried having a Slack or a Discord or one yeah, of these or things. Yeah, Telegram, right? People use Telegram. Telegram, and well. it, yeah. it's often just like it, it becomes like this source of pain for them. They're like, "Oh my god, it's this whole thing," and I'm like, yeah, "It's not yeah. mine," and I can't really. It's got a life of its own. It's really spammy. Like the life. They get really spammy. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hard to make it right, and we're not trying to make you know to the extent that we're building it, we're not trying to make the best standalone communication product for any purpose. We're trying to make the best place to build community and hang out with your, your Substack audience and among your Substack audience. Um, and so we've been trying to like make sure that we're building that with people who are actually doing that. Because th this is the fun part about building something like Substack, which in my estimation is like a wholly new thing, is all of the interesting features of it are emergent. You don't find out until you have the actual people trying to use them. <laughs> and then you find out whether it's working or not. And so yeah. we're, we're being pretty thoughtful and building it with uh, real people and getting their feedback and making sure it's good. So Substack is not that big as a company, right? An order of $10 million a year in revenue is very small as companies go. And yet I've heard a ton about it. It's gotten a lot of coverage in the media. As a journalist, I know that journalists love writing about other journalists and writing about journalism. <laughs> and I think that's part of it, right? So you've gotten a lot of, of coverage for that. Also, you know, your company has been criticized for paying certain kinds of writers to come to the platform. And, you know, I'm not interested in relitigating the details of that, but I'm curious how the sort of two sides of that have played out, right? How getting covered much more than a company your size would get covered if it weren't basically a media company or a sort of media adjacent company. How has that been for you? Have the pluses outweighed the minuses? How do you weigh that? Yeah. The way that I think of this is that we, you know, Substack has an outsized impact on the culture. Um, people care about it for reasons that are valid and go beyond the money. We've taken a lot of heat. We've had people very thrilled at us and very mad at us. And I've always felt like we can't complain too much about that. You know, we kind of set out with these, you know, the the two ambitions, but one of the ambitions is very grandiose, right? It's about making this new business model for writing and culture on the internet and having that dramatically shape the world and who people are. And there's just no way that you succeed at that without, you know, running towards the fire, 
running towards the heat of the culture war and the media and the spotlight and all of the things that people care about. And so as much as it can be both thrilling and uncomfortable, I don't feel like we get to complain. This is kind of what we signed up for and all of our paths to success do lead through it. We'll be back in a minute with the lightning round. Okay, let's get back to the show. We're going to close with the lightning round. There are two names that come up in the lightning round here that I didn't explain during the interview, but I should have. Uh, one name is Jane Jacobs. She's the author of a book called The Death and Life of American Cities. Uh, the other name is Matt Levine. He's a finance writer who writes a newsletter for Bloomberg News. Now, let's get to the lightning round. What's the most important lesson you learned from reading Jane Jacobs? Ooh. I love the, the broad impact that small practical details of the spaces we inhabit can have on how we live our lives. And there's lots of stuff in Jane Jacobs that's like that. I don't know if all of it is well empirically supported, but there's this fascination <laughs> with, you know, if you have uh, homes that have windows at street level and people are looking out, people walking down the street feel a different way. And it's this very brass tax, like physical aspect of geometry that ends up broadly shaping people's lives. I think cities are like that. And I think that the digital places we create are like that too. Okay. If you could have one person in the world start writing a Substack, who would it be? Might be Matt Levine. Oh, sure. Me too. Same. Um, he would make so much money. It's absurd. I'm sure uh, he's doing well, I'm, but uh, yeah. Um, it's a good choice. Really, really got me with that one. Um, if everything goes well, what problem will you be trying to solve in five years? One thing I think about if we're you know, successful in all the things we want to succeed at, this becomes this bigger and bigger. The, the GDP of the substack averse gets, gets more and more. You know, we are built on this foundation of the ideals of a free press, the ideals that writers should get to like have their space and make what they want. One thing that I could see being very interesting is as that goes international, having that collide with various societies where unlike here in the US, there's not a strong legal and cultural protection for the idea that people should be allowed to write, have ideas, people should be allowed to sign up for it. Um, I think yeah, that was not be, a free press, right? And there's not a free the press. World, there's not a free press. Yeah. And yet on Substack, there is a free press. And what does that yeah. mean for us? That that should be an interesting problem. Should we earn the right to confront it? How many Substacks do you get? Oh man, hundreds. <laughs> how, how many do you read? How many do you read? Um, many, I pay for tens and I read probably at least all of those ones. I read a lot of Substack to the, it's, it's really, it's great. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an avid user. I thought you were going to say it's a problem, but I guess you wouldn't say that. Um, no, I love it. It's a great, everyone should, should mimic me in this capacity. <laughs> um, what's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody trying to solve a hard problem? Have a grand science fiction vision of what you're trying to do and take one step at a time. Uh, you think you're going to, work on Substack forever? Could be. Is there something that would like signal to you that it's time to do something else? Mm. If we go to business and they physically have me removed from the office, I would probably have to consider my options. Chris Best is the co-founder and CEO of Substack. Today's show was produced by Edith Russolo, edited by Robert Smith, and engineered by Amanda K. Wong. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and we'll be back next week with another episode of What's Your Problem?